before we start that are always the most awkward. Bear with us. All right, I am going to get started, even if some more people show up, because the stuff in the beginning, well, you know what, it isn't that important, and I want to get to the stuff at the end. So good afternoon. My name's Howard Diner. I'm from a company called Big Visible, uh, work in the States. You may ask what Big Visible is all about, and I really don't know if I could tell you. Um, basically, we make business better. Um, do all sorts of stuff as an Agile coach. Um, actually end up doing a lot of other kinds of business consulting and um, process stuff, mostly in software, as you might expect. Um, and that's about it. Let me get started, and you know, here's the entire presentation. Well, that was good, we can all leave now. But uh, I want to give you an idea to get started about what we're going to be discussing. <clears throat> and if you're here for a different reason, this might be interesting to you. We're talking about QA. We're talking about people in QA. How many people in the audience uh, are in QA organizations? OK. How many people in the audience have a separate QA organization than a development organization? Pay attention. You have things to bring back Monday morning. <laughs> OK. This session is not about the QA people themselves very much. It's really about the organizations. It's about the way that the structure in organizations has to change, right? It's about what happens that's going to allow agile type testing to work well, right? It's also about when you go to your managers and tell them what needs to be done, this has a tendency to turn their world upside down, OK? So we're going to be uh, talking about the type of mindset that we need. Additionally, we have to understand the patterns of resistance. Who in here gets this picture? OK, good. We have some EEs. What value are those resistors at? <laughs> we'll talk about it later. Uh, there will be some enigmatic pictures. And if you have any questions, just shout them out. Um, and we're also going to talk about the work that gets done and how the organization now starts to fit together. OK, so let's talk about an agile testing organization. Quickly, what's, what's different about it? Well, the first thing that's different about it is that we're not talking about quality control. Right? Quality control and quality assistance are two very separate things, but people don't, don't get it. Quality control is all about making sure that we inspect products and don't ship defective ones. Okay, we use it in a manufacturing world. Okay, we use it when we're producing goods in mass manufacture to get the cost down, right? It, it's something that we uh, know the process. We can set up assembly lines. We l use large, <coughs> pardon me, large batch sizes, right? So the amount of parts, ah, the voice. The amount of parts on the assembly line um, is a large batch. Do people get that concept? We'll talk more about it. <coughs> And um, we want to make sure that we understand that software is very different. We can't produce it the same way. Okay? When we do stuff with blueprints, and then take those blueprints and make them into products, right, we have everything figured out. We know that if we follow the plan and we use quality materials, that we can produce the same car time after time. Right? We can't do that with software. We need an adaptive process, as you know. So if you ever see one of these kinds of uh, advertisements, you know, things like uh, guaranteed 50% reduction in your costs, don't just turn away, run away. Right? This can't work. Um, in fact, uh, we can't go back to the uh, manufacturing analogy where at each station along the assembly line, 
we add a small increment <coughs> of value. Right? The, the reason is that the variability in what we're trying to put together, so-called requirements, the variability in what we use to put that software together with, the so-called frameworks, whatever. There's so much variability inside of it that we can't do a good job of estimating. We can't go do a good job of knowing what we really need. And this comes up, this comes up when we start talking about software. I mean, how many people have ever coded the same piece of software twice? You know, you build some system to do uh, computer-aided design, takes you three years, and then you say, hey, you know what? We want to build exactly that same piece of software from computer to design. It doesn't happen, right? So it's different, okay? Um, we have to start understanding that when, in a manufacturing sense, uh, we do our quality control at the end, and we end up with this like big box of parts, right? We're looking at defects here. We're looking actually at a big box of money. We don't want to do that. Nobody wants to do that. And this happens because of large batching, which we'll talk about. Detroit used to be the big manufacturer of cars in the States. They almost went out of business in the 70s and 80s and 90s. All right, they went out of, almost went out of business to uh, Japan <clears throat> because Japan understood what small batches were. In fact, in the Japanese system, if you look at it, it looks something like this. Right, you got an assembly line for cars. We have um, the pieces that are going into the cars, the inputs, if you will, that are delivered just in time. Right, when we have just in time, we think about delivering our requirements just in time. We know the most and make the best decision, but we're not going to talk about that really. But what we are going to talk about is this and in line. Right, on the Japanese manufacturing, the Toyota production manufacturing system, if a defect occurs, the worker pulls the line and the assembly line stops. And then we go back and we fix it. Okay? We make sure that we're always producing zero defects along the way. Right? Now we have the same sort of concept in Agile. Right? This happens to be like Scrum, we're looking at a project board. Okay? We are able to have smaller batches. We'll talk about this in a minute, about what we mean by smaller and how small they can get. Uh, we do our work iteratively. We come back and check, right? If at the end of a sprint something isn't working, we don't keep on going. We stop, we fix it, right? So we try to incorporate those kind of values. When you don't do that kind of stuff, when you test at the end, you end up with situations like this, right? This was the Ariane. It's a um, French rocket, 1996. Uh, what you're seeing is what you call a catastrophe at, at takeoff, a Cato. And uh, it happened when they did a root cause analysis because of some 64-bit integer being stuffed into a 16-bit integer, and oops, something happened. Was that a failure in testing? Maybe. Was it a fa failure in manufacturing? Maybe. Right? But we will try to... <laughs> I kind of like it with the lights off. Um, in any case, the Toyota production system, um, we need to pivot in the same way when we're building and testing software, especially the testing part. A lot of people talk about Scrum and the building part. People forget that there's tests that go on. Okay, the two big differences. Two big differences that we're going to talk about um, are with the QC mindset. When we get to the end of a release, what do we do? We start testing. What happens if things don't go well? Well, we write reports and we go back and we fix it. Okay, to me, this sounds like a task of Sisyphus, right? The guy who was a French, um, I'm sorry, a Greek mytho mythological creature. Okay, the king was being punished. And you have to push this big boulder up the hill, and his punishment was the boulder would come down the hill and you have to push it up again forever and ever. That is an epic fail. Instead, when we start getting the proper QA mindset put together, we're going to start baking the quality in as we go. We always have to be ready to ship. Right? And until and unless we do that, we're always going to be noodling around in the code, 
when it comes time to release. We're never going to be sure of exactly when things are going to happen. We're never going to be sure if things are going to work in the field. We can't do that. Our bacons, so to speak, will get cooked. QA, what is it like in, in an organization? Well, I hate to tell you this, but you're still going to be doing testing. Okay, that doesn't go away. It's the approach that is different. Enigmatic picture, this is what it looks like in a small plane when you're going to make a landing. It's called the approach. Um, the, the difference in approach is that we know that we're not going to be testing our way into quality. And that's a very important thing to remember. There is no way to test quality into your product. The only way to do it is to build the quality as you go. Um, the way that we do this is to make sure that QA comes in for the entire life cycle, right from the beginning. Another way of thinking about that is that we're going to bring testing forward. And we're going to stop, we're going to stop thinking about a separation, so to speak, of church and state, where you write code and then you test the code. Instead, we're going to be thinking more like we build code together. Now, this is my favorite. Does anybody know what this is that, that's being displayed on the screen, per chance? Cucumber, yes. This is a Gherkin script, which then gets executed in Cucumber. It's, what, it's uh, kind of an acceptance test. Look at this well. This is what you should be doing. Okay. Um, the difference is that instead of going and starting at the beginning when like no code is written, what do, what do QA people do? Oh, we write test plans. Uh, what's a test plan? Oh, it's the stuff we have to think about when we go about testing. Forget that. I want BAs and QAs and developers right at the start writing these sorts of acceptance tests. These are simple. Right? You can read it. You can understand kind of what it is just by looking at it. Right? Those three amigos, BAs, QAs, and developers, using the traditional enterprise sorts of terms, when they get together and write this kind of stuff, they don't need any stinking requirements documents. They don't need any stinking specification documents. They don't even need the stinking story cards. These become your executable requirements because they'll tell us if it's working or it's not. So the question I want to ask you is, if I'm saying that you don't need requirements anymore, how come? What's the difference between a requirement and a test? So let me see if I can give you an example. I require that um, I burp a yellow jelly bean after I eat a red jelly bean followed by a green jelly bean. That's the requirement. Build me a system that does that. How am I going to test the system? The test would say something like, eat a green jelly bean, eat a red jelly bean, observe. Was a yellow jelly bean burped? <laughs> That's the same thing. There is no difference between testing and requirements. And the earlier we can start testing, the better things are. Because remember, back from the manifesto, we favor working software for comprehensive documentation. If you want to call the acceptance test documentation, fine. I call it code. I say that that's code that proves for the, for the cases that we are testing for that things continue to work. Because we want to build this into a regression suite, an automated regression suite, that will constantly be able to tell us that we haven't broken anything with some unknown side effects. And when we run our regression suite, which we're going to run one way or another every time we check in, and if we're doing things like TDD, that means every time we write a new unit test, we can make sh and we follow this simple rule. Right? We know that software isn't working if the code doesn't compile, right? New rules. If the tests are failing, any of the automated regression tests are failing, it's as bad as the code not compiling. Follow that simple thing, and you're going to be producing quality software from day one. That means that agile testers are actually developers that are developing tests. Okay? There's, um, there's no reason that a developer should have to look through a whole bunch of documentation and try to figure out what it is they're supposed to build. Give them the test, give them just enough information, collaborate with them, okay, and then when the test passes, they know they got it right. And the same thing goes for the testing. 
There's no reason that the test person, the QA person, should have to read through all that documentation to try to figure out you know, uh, what's different. And then getting the QA people to look at what's different from the, what was developed and forming a gap analysis. I, I, I don't understand the reason for it. Okay? Uh, pictures might be worth a thousand words. An automated test is worth a thousand pictures in a document. The problem really is that it's very hard with words to sometimes describe what's wrong. Very hard with just words. Having code that does it, or in this case, uh, we're actually looking at pictures of, uh, of a user level acceptance. That's the way that we do it. But the important point here is that we need the automated test. It's either red or it's green. And that's it. Once tests are automated, that QC sort of a person doesn't have to you know, worry about the fact they got this really long test plan with a whole bunch of manual steps that they have to run through, which means they don't want to do it, right? Because um, computers, computers are really good at automatically executing stuff time and time again. Okay, they don't need sleep, they don't complain, they don't, they just do it, right? Uh, computers are also really good at not getting bored. When you're doing your testing manually, it's very easy for your eyes to glaze over and miss something. Right? This is one of the problems about manual testing. Here's a really important point. When we start getting agile testers involved early, they also learn about the environments that are necessary to run their tests inside of. Okay? This concept then starts translating into what's commonly called nowadays DevOps. The QA people on the team are the ones that really understand now how to make things work and how to migrate from one environment to the other. Perfect! Because what we really need is more than what we just normally call working software, which is demonstrable. What we really need is not just continuous integration, we need more continuous delivery. And until we can reduce that cycle time of getting there, getting our software into the hands of our users to get meaningful feedback, until we get to that point, we're always going to have some more wasted cycles. But we're going to talk about more of the waste as we, in just a second. Uh, as if you didn't know, DevOps comes from developers and operations, but it's QA that really makes it, makes it work. Good. We're almost getting to the meaty part. A quick review of what kind of tests there are that are out there. It's called the Mechanical Turk. It was developed as a chess playing computer of a sense. It was developed in the 19th century. And the kings and queens of Europe would play against this. Um, there was a little guy sitting underneath it in a closed box who was looking at the play going on through like some mirrors. And he would move this rope, this uh, whatever you call it, the Mechanical Turk. People couldn't tell the difference though. It looked as though this what do you call this? This robot was playing chess, but he wasn't. Black box testing means that we don't know what goes on inside the code. We only look at what the functionality is. Okay, and you know, as long as it responds to our stimulus correctly, we don't care if there was a little guy on the other side typing out the answers. Okay, and it tells us, by the way, if we built the right thing, okay, that our requirements were correct. Contrast that with white box testing, which is not really testing, it's a coding practice. We also call those unit tests. We can look inside, open up the hood, see how the code works. We develop our test as we go so that we can make sure that we built the thing right. We can make sure that all the alternatives and exceptions inside the code are reasonable. Right? And we can continue to make sure that as we add new code that we're not breaking other pieces by side effect. Gray box testing probably isn't too familiar to you, because I think I kind of made the word up. Um, but gray box testing is in between. It's these acceptance tests, like these Gherkin scripts. Okay? Acceptance, test-driven development, gray box testing. We want to make sure that the developers and the business people, the BAs or the product owners, wherever we're going to call them in our process, are speaking the same language. So we've got to get a domain language that works. We're going to write our Gherkin scripts. I happen to like Cucumber. There are other frameworks. We're going to write that in that domain language. 
Now, everybody can make sure that we're all building the same thing, that there isn't a communications gap. We're not going to talk about functional versus non-functional testing. Um, I, I'm sure everybody knows it, but if we built a trading system and it could trade one share every hour, well, we need a system that trades 10,000 shares a second. Well, we, we didn't hit on some of the performance characteristics, the capacity, the latencies, all the illities are non-functional. It's generally outside of what we, what we normally do. A lot of QA people get involved in it. It's also much harder to automate, but we could talk afterwards if you want to about that. The basic pivot, destroy the silos, get business and developers together, collaborating, right? Um, make sure that our code is always ready to ship. We should not have to have a long amount of time to get the code into the hands of users to gain feedback. Okay, and when we do this, testing becomes very deeply embedded, very deeply embedded in the whole product cycle, okay, where the product is saying what the things are that we need to build. It becomes very embedded in the project cycle of how we go about doing that building. And the important point is that everybody can feel safe that all the things that we've been adding move forward fearlessly. We're always ready to ship. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the lean. So this is where I wanted to get to. Okay, and I'm going to talk about some wastes, in particular waste dealing with uh, work in process. If you've uh, heard of or read Eric Reese's book on uh, lean uh, startup thinking, you'll see this example. He took the example um, in it from a guy named uh, James Womack who wrote it with uh, Daniel Jones. Um, and um, Womack was uh, back in the 90s. He was a guy that was talking about lean in business, right? Um, he was uh, kind of a consultant. Uh, back then, when you wanted to reach people, you didn't send them a big, you know, spam of uh, mail. You know, uh, instead, what you did was you took your flyers and you put them in envelopes and mailed it to people. So he'd have several hundred envelopes that had to get uh, mailed every, every month. He had two daughters. One of them was nine, one of them was five. He decided to have a little fun one day. He said, guys, let's, have, let's play a game. I have to mail out these 200 newsletters, okay? Um, and I need you to help me. Like, daddy, 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 I know how to do this, I know how to do this. Okay, well, sure, what do you want to do? We're gonna make an assembly line, okay? We're gonna, we're gonna take all the flyers, and then we'll fold them all up put them in a nice, neat stack, and then, then we're going to take all the, the things that are folded and we're going to put them into envelopes, right? Then we'll take all the envelopes and we'll stack them up and then we'll take them off and address them. And then we'll put them in another neat stack and we'll put the stamps on them. And then they'll, they'll be a stack and they'll be all ready to go and be really efficient. You know, we're going to have an assembly line. Like they built cars and stuff. And kids actually will learn this really early on. So James said, well, <sighs> gee, I don't know. The way I usually do it is you take a flyer, you fold it, you put it in an envelope, you address it, you put a stamp on it, and you deliver it. And that works for me. But you know what? Let's have a game. Let's try it. We'll both go. Ready, set, go. Who won? No, the kids lost. <laughs> kids lost. They lost bad. How come? The, what you're not, what you, what's not intuitive is that there's a lot of waste involved in folding the envelopes and putting them in a nice, neat stack, squaring it off, taking each one off and putting it inside of an envelope and then stacking up the envelopes. There's even worse stuff that happens. What if you take the first newsletter and fold it and then fold all the others exactly the same way and find out that the newsletter doesn't fit in the envelope? Oops. <laughs> right? You do them one at a time, and you actually get much better performance. This is called single stream flow, technically. Right? So, okay, so I'm talking here about the fact that you know, you're able to learn as you go. Right? We, fold, we fold the newsletter, found out it didn't fit, we fix it. We don't have that large batch of stuff sitting there that has to now be reworked. Okay, uh, Scott Ambler put together a diagram which shows the cost of fixing defects against the length of the feedback cycle. I don't want to go too deep into this, 
But basically, the later you wait to get some feedback, such as waiting until the end of all the envelopes are folded, or waiting until you're doing acceptance testing, right? the cost of fixing stuff is huge. If you can bring that forward and start getting your feedback loop earlier, okay, uh, and there's various ways of you know, get it all the way back to like when we actually write the code with test-driven development, for example, every time you shorten that feedback loop, it's going to cost you less money. All right, so don't believe me. Let's talk about another way that, that we uh, worry about waste in, in development. And here, I'm going to talk about libraries. If we ever have a library, then we build a library, you know, a kilometer away, and we need to move all the books from one library to the other, how do we do it? Well, one way to do it is to get a bunch of boxes. Take all the books off the shelves, put them neatly inside the boxes so you can stack the boxes up and not have them fall over. Take all the boxes, put them into hand trucks, Take the hand trucks, roll them maybe down the street or maybe into a van. Get the hand trucks in the new library, roll the hand trucks up, you know, put them next to the shelves, open up the boxes, figure out where all the books go now because you've got to keep them in order. Right? It can be a, a really hard way to do it. Right? There's another way to do it, and it's called a book brigade. And a book brigade looks like this. This was done in uh, Boca in uh, Florida, United States. Little demo here. We lost audio. There's a lot of loud music in the background. <laughs> and I love it how we follow the book. It's a lot more fun when the music's playing. It's actually uh, occurred, it's about a half a kilometer from one library to the new one. Remember, they took the book off the shelf, started to pass it person to person. It's a true single stream flow that just goes right in place. And you will see that unless, if you read the book that I, I reference in there, unless you're um, having to take the books off and put them in storage, Book brigades are the cheapest and most efficient way of moving things under a certain set of criteria. It's not going to work for everything. But I thought it was fun. Okay. So why did I show you that other than the fact that I wanted to have a little music playing here? Okay. What does this have to do with software development? Well, it has something to do because of flow. Right? It has something to do with the fact that when we start batching stuff up for QA, the traditional way of doing our development getting a whole bunch of tests that we then give to QA to bring over the line, right? Um, it's sort of like packing them into boxes, right? It's actually much, much better to get rid of the boxes. If we can get to single stream flow, I love you, right? But if you can't get to single streaming, at least keep it as a very small batch, okay? A small batch might mean that we do some uh, user acceptance tests if people do that during the sprint, okay, not waiting until the end. That's the difference, right? So don't pack your stories into QA acceptance boxes. Do them early. Write them as executable requirements if you can, right? And remember to treat any failure in your automated tests as if the code wasn't compiling. Talk about a different waste. Let's talk about Scrum or Fall for a second. And let's start with cargo culting. How many people know the word cargo culting? Excellent. Cargo culting was named by Richard Feynman, who was a, a, a Nobel laureate at Caltech. Um, he actually was involved in the Manhattan Project, the Second World War, developed the atomic bomb for the United States. Um, went on, people started to learn of him more when he served on the uh, commission for the failure of the space shuttle, Challenger. 
and uh, he was the O-ring guy. Anyhow, the 1974 commencement address at Caltech, there was a lot of pseudoscience going on, so Feynman comes up and says, look, guys, remember in the Second World War, the United States was trying to get you know, over to Japan. The way they did it was they'd hop little islands in the South Pacific. Every island that they'd land on, they'd send out the Marines, they'd build a big airstrip, they'd make a big control tower. These guys with headsets would come on. To the natives, who had never seen Westerners before, much less technology, the natives saw these huge birds coming out of the sky. They'd land on this big strip of, uh, of earth. They'd open up their bellies, and there'd be goods and, and things, food, all kinds of stuff that they got a, you know, they got a share of that too. When the war ended. The United States picked up all, of the, all the materials. They took it all home. The natives looked around. They said, where are those big birds? So what they said is, oh, we must not be, um, must not be worshiping the bird god very well. So they went out and they took bamboo and they built control towers. They put coconuts over their ears you know, for headsets. They marched around with uh, sticks that they carved, like they saw people marching on the base. And they felt that if they did this well, that the big birds would start coming down and giving them all the goods and services. Well, it doesn't work that way, guys. Right? That's, he called uh, that cargo culting. When we cargo cult, we might be doing agile. We might be coming up and asking three magic questions every day for 15 minutes, and then going back and doing whatever else. Right? Doing Agile doesn't work. Being Agile is what does it. So we can do cargo culting. Here's the way. You can take some notes if you want to do scrum or, scrum or fall. And people have probably, nervous laughter usually happens here. We could take a story and say, OK, we're going to split this story. I know you split stories in Agile and Scrum. We're going to split it into an analysis story. Then we'll have a coding story. Then we'll have a testing story. Right? That's a good Scrum or Fall technique if you're looking for one. Another scrum or fall technique right, is to take the story and take it within the same sprint and have one set of people work on the analysis and then pass that off to others that code it and then pass it off to others that do testing. It's another proven scrum or fall technique. Please don't do that. Uh, what, we need, what we need are cross-functional teams that can work all of the things at once. Right? If we want to be agile and we want to, you know, do Scrum correctly, that's how we would do it. Another vicious thing that we do, I want to spend some time with this, is called matrixing. Who here works in a matrix organization? Don't be, don't be afraid. OK. I hate this guy, Galbraith. He was up at Harvard in Boston, Massachusetts. 1971, he wrote this paper called Matrix Organizational Designs, How to Combine Functional and Project Forms. Basically, what matrix does is it takes your manager, and then assigns a whole other set of managers, and then says, you can report to this manager for this project, and you can report to this manager for this project, and I'll still tell you stuff to do. Right, so we added a lot more bosses along the way. Right? It uh, comes from a, from a desire to be efficient within our organizations. That comes from a guy named Taylor was hired by Henry Ford when Henry Ford put together his first mass manufacture um, plant in Rouge River in Detroit. Hired this guy, Taylor. Now, Taylor wasn't, isn't as bad as some people say. He actually brought scientific method and measurement to the workplace because before Taylor, the way you got the workers to be more efficient was to beat them with a stick. So instead, Taylor comes and starts doing time motion studies and see reach, but it's the efficiency that was the problem. And too many times our managers now try to make people that need to be creative to make them efficient. You can't be creative and efficient at the same time. Right? This is kind of what it looks like in a matrix organization. Right? Each person has like a, a percentage in which projects they're working on. This is what it looks like in a matrix organization. Right? You got a whole bunch of bosses telling you how bad of a job you're doing. The reason that that's a, a problem is that team members that are working are always task switching. Task switching is an evil, right? It never allows us to focus. Plus, the task switching itself takes time, right? 
it, and the time that it takes robs us, robs us from forming true teams, right? So this is, I always get his name wrong, so I'm going to try to do it correctly. Um, Patrick Lencioni wrote a book called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. And basically what he says in it, this is the, the big diagram, is that teams that don't form well will never, never perform well, right? If people can't trust one another on a team, then they portray themselves as invulnerable. When they don't trust one another on a team, they're afraid to start arguing with one another to get to the right things, which is called an artificial harmony. When the people on the team are artificially harmonious, they really can't make a commitment because they're afraid of conflicting with one another. So instead of making real commitments, they're ambiguous about what it is they're going to do. Right? Once they're ambiguous, then they don't want to become accountable. The way that you avoid accountability is you have very low standards. And once you're at that point where you're not accountable for anything, you don't need to worry about results. Instead, when things fail, you start pointing and saying, oh, it's his fault. Okay? Or the reason this didn't work is because of this external thing. It's not my fault. People then start exploiting the situation for their own status and ego. Right? So when software development teams are just kind of like put together with, you know, from a bunch of people that say, oh, you guys, you're a team. To me, that sounds like a pickup game. Okay, this happens to be basketball. I'm sure it's the same in cricket, which I know nothing about. Right? I wouldn't want to be on a pickup game and try to play the pros. I'm going to lose every time. The pros practice together. They learn their strengths and weaknesses. They understand how to work with one another. They know one another well. They can become a high performance team. And we need to do that. All right? Oh, yeah, there's one more issue. Remember the matrix? All right? We got all those project managers. The second that um, something becomes untenable and somebody can't perform, they're going to tell their project manager, who in the heck are you? Uh, this guy up here, he's my boss. He signs my paycheck. I'm going to do what he says. Right? So there's a real loyalty problem that starts coming up. It has to do with money. All right. Last but not least, let's talk about task switching. Now, I'm not sure if the laws here are in India, but I know in the United States it's becoming like a, a heinous crime to text and drive, as well it should be. Right? Here are some statistics. You know, you're six times more likely to cause an accident. Okay, then by, uh, you know, if you're intoxicated, it's like having four beers. 23 times more likely to crash. These are alarming type statistics. Yeah, people do it, right? The reason that you can't do it isn't because you haven't learned how to task switch well. It's that your brain isn't made to task switch. Okay, so Susan Weinshank talks about this. A couple of quotes from her. Okay, she talks about the fact that a task switch might take a tenth of a second, but when you start adding up all those tenths of seconds, it becomes really a big number, right? And task switching involves several portions of your brain, which I don't want to go through. But basically what has to happen, it's just like when the uh, you know, CPU gets interrupted. We have to save some state, put it away in a different part of our brain, readjust our focus to this new task to do, Right, and then get started with it. Who in here has ever been in a debugger for you know two hours? They're just about ready to get the right result, and then the boss comes in and says, "Oh, I got, I need you for a second out here." Right, and then you come back and you look. I have no idea what I was doing two hours ago. <laughs> right, everybody. I mean, this if you code it, this is going to happen to you. There's another. Uh, oh, and uh, managers, software managers, sometimes haven't gotten that picture. They think, "Oh, this is software." The people can juggle balls. They can't. It's the same as trying to text while you're driving. This is much more important, this diagram. You may want to remember this one. Right? It comes from uh, Gerald Weinberg's Quality Software Management System Thinking. Um, and I just put it into a chart. If you're working on one project, you can devote 100% of your time. This was, th by the way, these were observations from uh, some stuff that he did to observe how teams worked. If you're working on two projects, the task switching between them is going to be about 20% to switch from one project to the other, which means that you're going to become 40% efficient on any one project. Ooh, that could be damning. 
And it gets, it gets worse and worse and worse. He takes it out to five projects. At five projects, the amount of efficiency that you get, I forget what the exact number is, like 3 or 4%. He also says that your likelihood of actually completing any of these projects is kind of random at that point because there's so much task switching that's going on. So stop, don't become another statistic. Stop the matrixing. And that's how you boost productivity. Let's tie it together now. First part, bring projects to your teams and stop forming these teams to do projects. In other words, the matrixing thing. It's wrong because it increases our whip, right? Which means that we can't get the proper flow. We want to get down to single stream flow, OK? We also need to form teams that are efficient and can work with one another. We also have to start favoring product increments, not component increments. Okay, and we understand the problem of big, back, big, back, big batch thinking. Let me uh, tell you a short story here. There's a town, a, a, a town in Holland, a Dutch town called Drachten. And in Drachten, um, it's a medieval town, they had a problem where inside the center of the city, the, uh, the flow of traffic was very slow. And um, they also had a lot of accidents there. They were averaging around nine accidents a year in the early noughts. The uh, people in Drochten, you know, and the city council wanted better flow through the center of the city, and they wanted to reduce the number of accidents. So they got this guy named Hans Moderman, who came up with a really radical idea. His idea to fix it was to take all the stop signs out and take out all the traffic lights. And somehow, the elders of the city said, OK, let's give it a try. What happened was it increased traffic flow, and the accident rate went down from nine a year to one a year. Why? <coughs> well, when cars were invented in the early 20th century, you had cars that were going you know, 40 kilometers an hour through the center of a city. You had people walking at, I don't know, five kilometers an hour. And they said, oh, that's a dangerous situation. What we want to do is make roads and put signs up there and traffic lights up there so we can control the flow of traffic. So when a driver is driving, they know that they have the right of way and they can be safe and just keep on going. They don't have to look around them and start making decisions. Now, we have that same artificial safety that goes on in an organization. When we put a lot of process, traffic flow lights, if you will, to say, we're going to do this, now we see what that is, then we do that, oh, and then we go over here. Instead, if you can start taking out, taking out all of those gates and start loosening up the flow, you'll actually get better stuff going through your system, and you'll change from a large batch mode into small, hopefully single stream mode. Remember that um, all of Lean Agile, it requires an inspect and adapt cycle. If you don't do it, you're going to feel like uh, Bill Murray in Groundhog Day. I hope everybody knows who that is. Um, never practice uh, methodology pythaism, okay, which is this and that. right? One deity at a time, guys. What I mean by polytheism, scrum or fall. Right? We're actually doing waterfall, and we're trying to do scrum at the same time. It doesn't work. Pick something that works for you. Figure out something that works for you and throw the old way of doing it away. Don't do two at once. Finally, start embracing the DevOps concept. It's not something you can just go out, if you read the cartoon, and just buy a big box of DevOps. Right? It actually is going to take some collaboration. It's going to take the QAs, BAs, and developers, the three amigos, to start working together. Right with QA starting to learn what has to happen in the DevOps kind of situation, and then actually applying it. And that, ladies and gentlemen, means that we're looking at the end. We'll have some questions, we'll have some answers, a little debate, and then we'll depart. Questions? So, you have a, you, did you have a question? Yes. Oh, 
I'm unsure how to answer that because it depends on how big of an organization it is. In a small organization, all of those defects that you're talking about would get put into the whole mix of the backlog. If we're talking about a scrum type environment, which everybody probably understands, and then we would work through it. Other organizations would look at, at those defects and say, ah, oh, we need to scale because we need these people to do more development. And we'll have a different team to do the defects. Maybe with the defects, they're all pretty small. And you know, maybe the assumption is that they're all fairly quick. What you might want to do is start up with a Kanban so that you can learn. You can learn where your whip starts coming, becoming hard. You can start learning what your process really is and then make improvements to lower it. Right? Um, and then there's other ways of going about it. But the important thing is that you've recognized that those defects can start becoming a large batch, right? Where we're going to take them to a change control board, and we're going to decide en masse which ones we're going to fix the next release and which ones we're not. Think of it much more continuous flow, and you'll be better off. It may be part of your process of how you deal with them. I do want to say that defects are wonderful requirements because they say I did this, 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 and this, and I got the yellow jelly bean, and instead I want to do this, 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 and I get a green jelly bean. So we can write right away and know, know exactly when the defect gets fixed. It was a good question, though. Oh, sorry. Take another one. Executable requirements. Yes. Well, first of all, I'd like you to do it Monday morning, but you're not. It's going to take a while, especially if you're not used to automation, you know, and all that stuff. Okay. But the first thing to start doing in that sense is to start learning about behavior-driven development. That's the acceptance test that I happen to like. Okay. Um, if you're a Java type, you know, Ruby type programmer. Uh, the products to look up are like Cucumber. If you're a .NET developer, you're going to want to look up something called SpecFlow. Same kind of ideas, right? Um, somehow you have to get started down that road because those are really great ways of capturing requirements. Okay, and then you have to put them into your continuous build system once you get one. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Okay. So for a scrum team, it is fine. Yeah. When it comes to scrum up scrum, or when they have to look at a UAP or anything like that, uh, is it really feasible? Actually, uh, the, the QA, you know, like they support their development to continue to update to the velocity. Um, they don't really focus on end to end UAP. Why? Right. That's the problem. <laughs> the problem is that, you know, we're thinking in terms of UAT. And if you recall Scott's diagram, we're waiting to do the testing when we're out here, right? And just like the girls that were folding the envelopes, they didn't find a problem until way late, right before they're trying to ship, and then they're pushing that rock up the mountain only to have it fall down every night. So the way to get around that, okay, is to start that automation kind of early. If I say things like a dependency inversion, people kind of get the idea, right? We have an interface. In our, in our, in our architecture, we do a dependency and a version of control, right? One of the things that we start on is to make a test implementation that implements that interface in something that's either a fake or a mock, some kind of a test double, right, that will execute really fast, okay? So we don't have to worry about doing our end-to-end -end testing and having it take that long, right? So we'll typically test all the time, 
you know, with a mocked out or faked out interface. Then later on, we start doing stuff in the middle of the night, over the weekend, to run more of the things end to end all the time. Again, QA knows this stuff because they're the ones that are responsible for trying to get it to work in that testing environment. And that becomes valuable knowledge for DevOps. Sir? Yep. Mm -hmm. I don't know the ratio. It all depends on the developer. All right? If the developer is a really capable developer, he's going to be able to produce code and unit test it faster than some QAs are going to be able to you know, work and actually do, run the test against them. So you're going to have to find whatever works for you. This is a, a situation, by the way, where something like a Kanban would help. Because we would start seeing where things are involved and where, our, or where we're getting a, a whip pile up. And then we would know to fix that by adding more QA people. But this, that's getting more advanced here than what we want to get to in this. Yes, ma'am. The DevOps isn't anything that's, that's weird, right? It's not a person, right? It's kind of bringing in the operations people to understand what's going on when development is taking place, OK, so that they get a more advanced knowledge of it. If, we're, if, if I'm talking about QA getting a mindset of bringing testing forward, I'm also saying operations should bring operations forward, if you will, and get involved earlier on, rather than throwing documents over the wall. OK, we're done. Here's, your, here's how you take care of this system. Doesn't work as well. Got to get pretty granular, doesn't it? Because <laughs> we actually will have to put together test cases that, sh that you can verify and actually run through it. And that is a problem. A lot of people who like to write stories like to be kind of uh, vague. Oh, they'll ask me questions while we're doing development. They'll you know, we'll figure it out. It actually is very vague. And that vagueness isn't good for trying to make commitments. Right? If you're in an organization that wants solid commitments, you don't know how to commit to something if you can't really understand it. And the faster you get towards understanding exactly what it is to say that I'm done, you, you, the better off you, you are, the faster you do it. The other side effect of this, by the way, is that once you start having a whole suite of unimplemented um, user, uh, I'm sorry, uh, automated regression suite scripts, you know, those Gherkin scripts, you can actually do a fairly decent job of seeing how done you are. Right, because every script says it's, it works or it doesn't. As the number of working scripts starts increasing, you're getting closer and closer to where you have to be to be actually completely done with a release. So it's a kind of a side benefit that you might get out of it. Uh, sure. Is QA uh, relevant at all? That's actually a really great question. Because on a, on a real scrum team, or, or let's just say a software development team, a delivery team, the roles should get fuzzed out. Eventually, you might not know the difference between a developer and a QA person, because they kind of do each other's job sometimes. And it's also a really good reason that you want to do it is to upskill people so that it becomes a, a path, a, a career path. You don't want to get pigeonholed as a QA person all your life, perhaps. You'd like to do other things, or at least be exposed to it. And it's, it's a really useful concept to work with. So yeah, sometimes I can't tell the difference between QA and development. And that's a good thing. Uh, sure. Depends. Um, the typical definition of acceptance test driven development is um, at uh, like a controller level, OK, business logic level. I believe there's a lot of value in actually doing the automation all the way up through like a selenium, okay, but using like a page object as, as the mechanism that I'm actually doing my testing against. Because I want to keep the problem with doing automation at the presentation layer 
is it kind of becomes very fragile. So if you do it, start looking into things like page object for Selenium or other ways of um, abstracting, you know, so that it's, it's not so fragile. All right, we are done. I want to thank you very much.